you're visiting with us, we welcome you. I've been speaking the past few weeks on the subject of the home, under the subject of home improvement. And uh, under that subject, I have spoken to you what the Word of the Lord says and what Jesus has said. And we serve a, a very, very wonderful God, all wise, the Bible calls Him. And uh, the Bible says here in Psalm 127, you'll notice in verse number 1, very carefully where he says in verse 1, Psalm 127, verse 1, if you just got here and need, need to open your Bible, Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. You'll notice in this text here, the disposition of the Lord is to build and not destroy. God is interesting in improving your life, not in destroying your life. And God is an all-wise God, and He knows exactly what it takes to be able to build a home where is in that home there is happiness and there is some joy and wherein it is productive. God is, is an all-wise God. And the Bible says, except the Lord build the house. Now, Jesus told us that you got two choices. Now, either you're going to build on the rock, and the Bible says that's the wise man who builds his house on the rock. That's the guy and the woman who hears the Word of God and obeys it. Compared to the one over here that's foolish, who builds their house on the sand, who hears the word, but then it goes in here and it goes out here and it's never connected to the heart, the hands, or the feet. He said storms are coming against both houses and life is rough. Nobody gets off this round ball of dirt and water without scars and without trouble and without struggles and without heartache and challenges. They're going to come against both homes. The one that is able to stand and endure the storms are the ones who embrace the wisdom of God and the fear of the Lord, and they order their household accordingly, the best they can according to the Word of God. So I'm going to ask you this morning, especially the ladies, because it just so happens that this is Mother's Day. I didn't pick the timing on this particular message to fit on Mother's Day, but the Lord providentially worked it out. Last week I spoke about the responsibility of the, of the husband and the father in the home uh, concerning him preparing himself uh, before he takes on a wife. And here we're going to look at some things. Look with me in the book of Proverbs, if you would, in chapter number 14. This morning we're going to look at the woman or the wife. Okay, now before I read this verse, I want to remind you of something. I want you to, re to remind you that your Creator has a divine design for marriage and for the home. And all of us, all of us in here need the wisdom of God to help us to build our home and do it His way. Men have a tendency when they get something that comes in a box to put the instructions to the side and to begin to put it together as they see fit. And then when it doesn't work, they get agitated and aggravated and want to send it back. And usually they call the company and the company says, well, did you read the instructions? And well, did you follow the instructions? I ordered a, a, a small building from my backyard uh, several months ago. And uh, Nathan, my son, came to help me put it together and thank God that he did. And it was in a thousand pieces. And we carefully followed every word on in that book for the first time in our lives. And believe it or not, it worked. It worked. But boy, it took some time and patience and some endurance and sometimes we'd get to a part and say, this don't make any sense. 
Well, this doesn't look like this is going to work. This is not the way I would have done this. But we're going to do what they say. And we're going to trust it's going to fit together when we get it all together. And you know what? They were right. Did you know that God is smarter than you and I when it comes to marriage, being a husband, being a wife, being a father, being a mother, if we could just trust what He's written down on these pages of this book? I want to remind you of the divine design of marriage, and then we're going to go to the, to the mother and the wife. The Lord Jesus Christ, the words of our Savior, the Bible says that marriage is honorable. Did you know that? Marriage is honorable. And the bed undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. That's His words. So being sleeping together, shacking up together, does not mean you're married in the sight of the Lord. So you got to get that through. Understand that. Because what you're doing is you're you're taking advantage of each other without committing yourself to one another for life. That's what you're doing. You're using the other person is what you're doing. And you're being used is what's happening. And the Lord said that won't stand when the storms come, and they will. It won't hold up. This is what the Bible says. Okay? But Jesus said the divine design of marriage is heterosexual, not homosexual or bisexual. Number two. It is monogamous, not polygamous. Number three is to be permanent, not temporary. When they gave you a marriage license, it does not expire. Amen? It's to be enjoyed, not endured. He that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, the Bible says. Okay? So understand this too. That God is not only in the saving business of our souls, but He also is in the repair business. And He's very good at it because sin has ways of wrecking our lives and messing it up. And He comes along and He helps us to repair. You remember, listen, whether you know this or not, Jesus does care about what's going on at home and in your heart. If you'll read John chapter number 4, He was talking to a woman at the well. And as He was talking to her... He said, I have water, uh, you know, that when you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. And she said, man, I, I, I want that kind of water because there was, there was something in her life that was not fulfilling and she was miserable and she wanted something that would last and, and everlasting life. And Jesus said, all right, if you want it. And here's what he said now. He said, go get your husband. Mm. And she said... I have no husband. She was honest before him. That's what you got to be. And Jesus responded and said, you've answered correctly. And he said, the man you're living with now is not your husband. And you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. How about that? And she was shocked that he would care about her moral life and what was going on. And she understood that he saw her, but yet he did not reject her. He received her, saved her, and changed her life. And that's what God does. John chapter 8, he runs into another situation where the Pharisees and Sadducees caught a woman in the act of adultery, brought her before the Lord and said, hey, we caught this woman in adultery. She ought to be stoned according to Moses. What do you say? Now Jesus knew that they were just looking to catch him in a trap. And so what, how does he handle that? Well, with wisdom. He exposes their hearts, and then he also delivers this woman. He says to them, I'll tell you what. The Bible says he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Without saying a word to him in response, he just started writing on the ground. And the Bible says that he said, Now, which one of you, or the one without sin in his own life, let him cast the first stone? Because you really, in, under the law of Moses, you had to have at least three witnesses, two or three witnesses. And so, started writing on the ground. The Bible says, from the oldest down, begin to walk away because their conscience was convicted. Whatever he was writing on the ground, the Lord 
was revealing to some of those rascals that they were just as guilty as she was. Maybe, maybe that older, older guy who may have initiated all of this, maybe he wrote down a woman's name. You ever thought about that? Maybe. And he realized, hey, he, he knows what's going on. And they all walked away, and he looked at that woman and said, okay. He said, where's your accuser? She said, there's none. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go. Now listen, that's where people stop. He said, neither do I condemn thee. But then he said, go and sin no more. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is ready to save you where you are, forgive you, change you, and put you on a new path. And start rebuilding your life through the blood of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. He can save you, change you, and help you. Now, I need to show you something here in Proverbs chapter 14. We talk about the divine development of where that a man has, to, uh, has responsibilities to provide and protect and to love his wife and to lead her, to be loyal to her. And by the way, fellows, if you're not ready to do that, ready to be a man, don't take on a wife. Don't do that. Chapter 14, verse number 1. Look at this. The Bible says, Every wise woman buildeth her house. But the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. This is a proverb of contrast and comparison. The wise woman and the foolish woman. I want to focus on the wise woman today. Would you agree with me in verse number one that the wise woman is constructive? She builds. The foolish woman is destructive. She plucks it down with her own hands. She destroys her own home and she does it herself. She is her own worst enemy. But let's focus on the woman who is building. And she understands that marriage and life and family is always a work in progress because it does not say in verse 1 that she built her house. It says she built it. She is something that she is continuing to do. It's such a work in progress. Ladies, if you would choose to fear the Lord today, now, what I'm going to tell you this morning is going to be completely contrary to what you hear at school, from your friends, on the news, on Netflix. It's going to be completely contrary because they are fools according to the Word of God. And if you want to build your house and you want to have something when you're 50, 60, 70 years of age, that you can embrace and enjoy, then you need to trust the Lord today. Fear Him. Fear Him. Trust Him. This is not dependent on how excellent or how terrible your husband may be. This is about you. This is about you doing your part and trusting the Lord. There are no perfect wives. There are no perfect husbands. And we all need the wisdom of God. And we're all wrestling with this. But I want you to notice in verse number one, it says, every wise woman. Every wise woman. I'm going to ask every one of you women in here, how would you judge yourself this morning? Would you consider yourself to be wise? are foolish. And if you're a young lady considering and contemplating marriage, would you consider yourself preparing yourself for marriage in being a wise woman? Well, let's, let's look at what the Bible has to say. Every wise woman. Would you agree that the, the wisdom of the Lord begins with the fear of the Lord? That you're not going to have the wisdom of God if you don't fear God? You have to fear the Lord. That's a choice, by the way. But let's start with point number one. Look with me in chapter 13, verse number one. 
Did you know that a wise woman is teachable? Watch what he says in verse 1. He says, A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. Now, whether it's a wise son or whether it is a wise daughter or whether it is a wise woman, what that means is, is that a wise person is a teachable person. So I'm going to ask you a question. Are you teachable? Brother Craig, the, 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 the power of this thought of you being teachable means that you, number one, if you're teachable, it means you are changeable. If you're able to receive teaching, it means that you can change. And if you can change, it means that you can become profitable and usable by the hand of the Lord. If you are unteachable, you are going to stay right where you are. You have to be teachable. You have to be teachable. There's an illustration of this in the book of Acts. A man by the name of Apollos. He, the Bible says he knew some things about the Lord, and he was doing the very best that he knew based on how he was raised to do what he knew to do, just like some of you are doing. You, you have been raised in whatever your parents have taught you or whatever life has fallen out, you're doing the very best you can based on what you know. And he was doing this, and he went into a place where he was actually doing some teaching, and Aquila and Priscilla recognized him, that he had a good attitude, and they pulled him aside, and they began to show him the more excellent way of the Lord. And you know what? He didn't act like a know-it-all. He said, man, I see that. Man, I want to be better. Man, I want to do better. I want to be a better man and a better teacher. And he received, and he changed, and God opened the door for him to be of greater use. Now, what I'm saying to you ladies is, Wherever you are in life, don't get stuck there. There's more to learn. Regardless of your age, there is more to learn. Well, let's talk about this for just a moment. To be teachable means to be changeable. It means <clears throat> then for you to be fruitful and to learn how to build something. By the way, if I'm, gonna, if I'm going to be asking someone to teach me something about building... I want to make sure they know how to build something. Amen? I've encouraged you ladies, please, especially you young ladies, stop seeking counsel and advice from your peers. Stop young ladies asking young ladies how to love your husbands, how to love your children. Stop asking people your age. If you're a young lady, stop that. And don't go to a woman that's a man-hater, regardless of her age. Men are hard to live with. That's why God made you to help us. The Bible says here that, verse number one, that a wise woman builds her house. She's teachable. So let me ask you a question. Are you, who is influencing you? Who is instructing you? I would encourage you, if you're a wise woman, to begin to go to a, a Bible-believing church. And God will provide instruction for you through the pastor publicly, but God will give you some friends in that church and some women in that church that fear the Lord who can help you privately if you're teachable. God will provide this for you if you love your family. Now, please, please turn with me to the book of Titus. This is very, very, very important. I want to show you the Word of God in the New Testament. I need you to look at it so that you will not be offended. I need you to look in Titus chapter 2 because some of the things I'm fixing to speak on is not very palatable today in our society. I make no apologies for what the Bible has to say. I want to say to our older women in our congregation, please... Do not ever take a young lady in our church and teach anything that is contrary to the Bible. 
and to sound doctrine. You are undermining that home. You are undermining this church and this pastor and my labor of love from the Word of God. Do not contradict what the Bible has to say. Well, I tried that and it didn't work. You are not the measuring tool. Because it could be that you knew what to do, but you didn't know how to do it. You know, have you ever considered that? God's Word is not a lie because you failed somewhere. Look in Titus chapter number 2, please. Look with me in verse number 3. Please follow along with me now because this is important, critical. Are you teachable? Okay, I'm laying some groundwork and I ask you to receive this. Titus chapter number 2, verse number 3. The Bible says, The aged women likewise. I realize there's nobody here that fits that category. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach, there's that word again, that they may teach the young women, a young woman's got to be teachable, to be sober. You say, Brother Roger, I'm not, I'm not a drunkard. To be sober is far, far more than referring to alcohol. It's referring to you not being a silly woman. It being serious about the things that matter. Paul warns about, about deceitful men going into homes and leading silly women captive who are laden with lust. Verse number 4 says, and that, that's that silly woman, that's the woman who spends more time on Facebook than she does in the kitchen preparing a meal for her family. The Bible says in verse 4 that you be sober. But notice this now. It says, do you need to be taught how to love your husband? Oh, no, Brother Roger. I love my husband. Do you love him the way God wants you to love him and the way that he should be loved in a godly manner? Because a lot of times we love people expecting and we do it selfishly for reciprocation. We do it a certain way, expecting something in return. Godly love invests and does what is in a person's best interest without demanding something in return. I can love you if you don't love me back. But you can't do that without the Lord. By the way, love never, charity never fails. You just got to keep at it. The Bible says in verse 4, he says to love their husbands and to love their children. Now what is, look at verse 5. To be discreet. What does that mean? Well, let's look at it. Chaste. Keepers at home. Good. Oh boy, this is, this is really, really not received today. Obedient. To their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. This has to do with an older woman teaching a younger woman how to build her house that she sets her priorities, her loyalties, and it's reflected in her attitude, and yes, even in her apparel and in her spirit. Notice it. Look with me a few pages back to your left. Look in 1 Timothy chapter number 2. By the way, you know what you're reading when you read 1 Timothy and, and Titus? You know what you're reading there, what that's called? Those are called pastoral epistles. And that pastor is to take it and teach the church so that the ladies can take it and teach the younger ladies what the Bible has to say. Look in 1 Timothy with me, please. Look in verse number 8. The Bible says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. He's not opposed to you fixing yourself up. Just don't let that be your focus. That you only focus on the outward, but you never focus on the inward. 
And the Bible says here, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, which becometh women professing godliness with good works. But notice he says in verse 11, talking about being teachable. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach. There he's talking about referring to teaching men. Because the older women are to teach the younger women. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. I told the Lord when I was studying this, I said, Lord, this is going to go over like a lead balloon. Nobody in our society believes this anymore. There's only a handful of Bible-believing Christians that actually embrace this and believe how wise that you are. And yet these women, they try to build their homes, but contrary to what you say. And so there's always a lot of trouble. You know, God made your man a certain way. All men, to some degree, have some of the same uh, ways about them. Uh, and, and God knows this. And God made men, in, uh, women in a similar way. And God knows this. And He made us one for the other, for the woman to complete the man. But you'll notice here, Hmm. The Bible says in verse 11, verse 9, let's start with that. He said, In like manner also women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. There are three things in the book of Proverbs that talks about the virtuous woman. And they're all here. They're all in the same place. Same principles. Because not only is she teachable, but she, as she is being taught, it develops in her the ability of her husband to be able to trust her. And marriage is built on trust. You've got to be able to trust each other. And this is reflected by a woman to her husband in various ways. The book of Proverbs in chapter number 31 talks about the woman how that her husband has no need of spoil, and that his heart safely trusts in her, and that she will be good to him all the days of her life, and that she has in her this principle of when she does speak, that she speaks with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. You say, man, that just sounds impossible, Brother Roger. You don't know who I live with. I want you to, number one, stop using him as an excuse for who and what you are. And then you choose to fear God. I mean, it might be in your situation, it might be beauty and the beast. I don't know. But I do know this, that you are going to have to focus on building your house. On building your house. Let's look at these passages for just a moment. The Bible here talks about in manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. We read those over in the book of Titus about being shamefaced. Does it matter to a husband how his wife dresses? Should it matter to a man how his wife dresses. Does a woman tell her husband, I'll wear what I want to wear. I'll talk when I want to talk. I'll say what I want to say. And I'll spend what I want to spend. And you are not going to tell me what to do. Well, I got news for you, lady. You shouldn't have gotten married. Because you're not a builder. You're a destroyer. And your husband is going to endure his relationship with you. He is not going to enjoy his relationship with you. And by the way, there are men who can endure it for a number of years. I know some who, I know two men who endured it for 40 years and then walked away from their marriage because they could not take it anymore. And I'm telling you, you don't have to receive what I'm telling you, but I'm trying to help you. 
Okay? L let me mention to you something about your clothing. There's never a pastor or a preacher that should ever, ever have to preach on your wives or your daughters dressing modestly. 